Good morning. <laughs> well, that uh, Ndinami is actually the plural. Uh, so anyway, we, we've been greeting one another. Uh, if you want to greet me, singular is Ndinao. Ndinao uh, is, the, is the singular. Uh, thank you, President Proctor, for the introduction and, and for the offering being taken for ICOM. Um, I'm very happy to be back to Ozark. This is my second or third visit, and my link is Brother Chris DeWalt through CIY. Uh, he came to Ghana a number of times, and um, Brother Wade is here somewhere. He was part of one of the uh, delegations that came from CIY to serve with us. Um, Brother Isaac Shade here, uh, 2000, my whole family, we were at McDonough Christian Church, and he and his parents, uh, they took us out uh, to have a good barbecue. If you want some really good barbecue, there's a place in McDonough, uh, Georgia, that uh, you can have it. Uh, I acknowledge the presence of my friend uh, Debbie uh, and her husband Jerry uh, from Mount Valley. Uh, he's a, she's a graduate of this uh, college, and uh, she partners with us, Gifts for the Nations is her ministry, and thank you, Debbie and Jerry, for coming here uh, this morning. But I also bring you greetings from my wife, Lydia. Those of you who would come to Peoria will meet her. Is a photo wrap there. Um, we were married in Johnson City, Tennessee, 1984. And uh, three children came out of that marriage. And our daughter has started giving us grandchildren. And number one is two years plus, And we are expecting number two on November 1st. So, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, please uh, keep Lydia, uh, keep uh, Yaira our daughter, in your prayers, uh, because Lydia and I will be here uh, while she has the baby there. Our sons will be back in Ghana, McAfee and, and, and Jacob. And so uh, when ICOM ends on the 19th, uh, the first thing on the 20th, uh, we will be on a plane going back to Ghana, and we can't wait to carry our uh, second grandchild. Um, I felt good this morning when I walked out of the door because I like the temperatures here in Joplin. Uh, three weeks ago, I was in Streeter, Illinois, and when I walked out in the morning, it was 45 degrees. Woo! That's freezing. And <clears throat> because Ghana, our country, is four degrees above the equator and on the Atlantic Ocean. So the average temperature is 85 degrees with humidity. And, and so uh, the temperatures you are having right now, uh, I, I love it and I want to stay here and I, I don't want to go back north to Indianapolis or Peoria, anywhere. So just keep the warm weather here in, in Joplin. One other thing about my country, is the tropical forest. Can we bring up that, uh, the photo of the tropical rainforest in which we grow some of the world's best cocoa? So the Germans may make a lot of chocolate or the companies Hershey and all those, uh, but the beans, the cocoa beans with which uh, they make the chocolate, the best ones in the world are grown in the tropical rainforest in Ghana. So my mission is to encourage each and every one of you to eat more chocolate. <laughs> <Woo! laughs> yeah, the more chocolate you eat, the more you are supporting missions. Some of those, uh, <laughs> some of those uh, uh, farmers, cocoa farmers, just like the bean farmer, uh, Dr. Practice, uh brother-in-law who gives to missions from his beans and, and other crops, the cocoa farmers would give some of their money uh, to missions. So 
please eat more chocolate. <laughs> Ghana also uh, has dry savanna grassland in the northern part, which is close to the Sahara Desert. Uh, we are bordered on the north by Burkina Faso, and some of you may have been there, but once you get into Burkina, uh, Brother Chris DeWalt and I were in Ouagadougou one time, and then we went to Niger, but all that place is close to the Sahara Desert. So in northern Ghana, they get rains only three months in the year. Uh, very dry out there. Uh, brother, uh, your president, President Prakta, has already talked about Ghana Christian Mission, uh, which I started when I left the U.S. in 1986 and, and went back to Ghana. I lived here for three years and went to Emmanuel School of Religion and uh, Dr. Charles Teba, uh, Dr. Norris, and uh, many of the professors there, they just not only taught us, but they modeled servant leadership for us and, and just laid the foundation for global missions. Uh, and I want you to take advantage, you students, of your time here, the time you spent with President Prakta, uh, Chris DeWalt, uh, Wade, and all your other professors, these are some of the best times of your lives where you are not just having a quality academic preparation, but you are ming mingling uh, with these men and women of God who have dedicated uh, their hearts and their minds and, and their strength to the Lord, and they are pouring into you, and, and, and that's inspiration that will take you the rest of your lives. So I went back from Emmanuel, and, and my wife, who is a medical doctor, and I started this mission, and God has blessed our work uh, in the past uh, 30 years. And part of that blessing has come from short-term missionaries and mi interns that came to work with us. We've worked with over 3,000 American short-term missionaries, uh, several of them from CIY, and we are grateful to each and every one of them. We give glory to God. I'm here today mainly because of the International Conference on Missions. I hope that slide can come up. ICOM exists to encourage, equip, and enlist the global body of Christ to be focused on missions until all people groups on planet Earth are rich with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm humbled to serve as president this year, and I chose the theme, Together, God's Plan to Redeem the World, because I believe that one local church alone, one Bible college alone, one continent alone, cannot reach all the remaining 7,000 and rich people groups in the world. Rather, we need the collective will and effort of all God's people from all nations, language groups, men, women, youth, professionals, non-professionals, long-term, short-term, and all other categories of workers networking and collaborating to finish the task. Someone has said the Great Commission is too big for anyone to accomplish alone and too important not to try to do together. Casey and Thomas are staff of China Outreach Ministries at Central Florida University, and they have said that no single ministry church or organization should work alone. They are all ministries of God's kingdom. It's important to cooperate with other organizations and churches so together we can accomplish more for the Lord. My brothers and sisters, I want to officially uh, welcome you to Peoria, Illinois, 
from November 16th to the 19th. Over 500 mission exhibitions will be there, over 100 workshops, a prayer room dedicated to global missions, and many other things would happen that weekend to help us focus on missions exclusively at this conference. On top of that, we also have live African drumming and dancing from the Every Association in Chicago. So come with your dancing shoes and dance at Magbaja. This morning, I want to use the story of Nehemiah leading and mobilizing the Jews who had returned from the exile to rebuild the broken walls of Jerusalem to inspire us to work together more to reach the remaining 7,000 people groups in the world. Turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 4, and we'll read verse 6, and also we'll read Nehemiah 6, 15, and 16. Nehemiah 4, 6, it's on the screen. It says, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart. For the people worked with all their heart. Then Nehemiah 6, 15 and 16 says, So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elal in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. This is an incredible account of God's people working together with all their heart to accomplish a great feat to the amazement of all the surrounding nations. Let's look closely at the details. The wall was 2.4 miles long. It was 40 feet high and 8 feet thick. Can you imagine? 8 feet thick. It had 34 watchtowers, seven main gates, and two minor gates. And it took 40 teams to complete it in 52 days. If you read the role of Nehemiah chapter 3, from the first verse to the last verse, it lists groups of people, the high priest, the priest, the men from Jericho, those from the blacksmiths from this community, from that community, they all pitched in and worked and got the work done. I want you to pay attention to the testimony that they worked together with all their heart and succeeded with the help of God. Let me ask you a question uh, this morning. What broken walls do Christ's disciples in Joplin, here at Oza Christian University, in the rest of Missouri, the entire USA, Africa, Europe, Asia, and the rest of the world, what broken walls do we have to rebuild today? I want to challenge all of us to regard the remaining 7,000 unreached people groups as a wall waiting to be rebuilt. The Joshua Project map speaks for itself. The Joshua Project map, you see that map, the red shaded area represents what's often referred to as the 1040 window, latitude 40, and then latitude four, uh, 10 and 40, 10 in the south, 10 at the north, with an estimated population of over 3 billion people who are unreached. 
That means there are less than 5% of their population who are Christians. They need help from outside. They need other language groups to come and help them. You and I should know no peace. We must be having sleepless nights like Nehemiah until we take steps, pray, strategize, mobilize, and take the gospel to them. I want to point two things out from this story which should inspire us, edify us this morning so that we can be part of the group that rebuilds the wall and make sure that the good news, the precious news of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the benefits we get as Christians, the Holy Spirit, Christian fellowship, they are singing songs that minister deep to our souls, attending Bible studies, uh, and applying the gospel to every aspect of our lives, our marriage, raising our children, our work. What is life without Christ? And that's what seven thousand people groups are having. Three billion people don't have the blessing you and I have. How can we be inspired to take the gospel to them? The first thing this morning is that we need to work together under God. Together under God. Together with God. All missionary endeavor must be firmly anchored on God's word and under his authority. Missions is no secular adventure or undertaking. It is not for personal fame or glory. It must never be for illicit financial gain. Rather, we must be motivated only by our love for God and lost souls and the obedience to God's command. Nehemiah obeyed the task God gave him. Because in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, he said, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. I had not told anyone what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. What is God putting on your heart for the indigenous Indian tribes in the reservations, for the Tuaregs in Algeria and Mali, for that people group in India or Sri Lanka, Today, the command of our Lord Jesus must still be fresh in our ears and burn our hearts. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely... I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Together under God means we must trust God for his protection and provisions in the missionary endeavor. Nehemiah 2, 8. He says, and because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. Because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. He was a cup bearer serving the king. And when he heard about the state of the broken walls of, of Jerusalem and the hopelessness and the despair that was there, he went to serve the king and he was sad. And the king said, what is wrong with you, Nehemiah? And he prayed, and, and he told the king, and the king said, what can I do for you? And he prayed, 
and said, do this for me. Give me this letter. I need timber. I need resources. He was very bold. And he got everything he asked for. And went back, shared the burden with the people, mobilized his people, and they got the job done. So the God who sends us to go will also give us the resources that we need. We must only ask boldly and in faith, as Nehemiah did. Again, from Matthew 28, 18 to 20, we must be reminded that Jesus sends us to the mission field with divine authority and assures us of his omnipresence 24-7. Nothing can stop us, absolutely nothing, not the threats of enemies like Tobiah and Sambalat or Isis or voodoo priests or whoever. Jesus, our leader, is Lord of Lords. Let us have no anxiety as we step out in faith and in obedience to reach the lost. Our backs are covered by God. Together under God is also a call to prayer as Nehemiah did. We need massive personal and group prayer specifically targeted towards global missions and devil. Just before I left Ghana three weeks ago, one of uh, our leaders organized a three-week fasting and prayer session and it warmed my heart because it was organized exclusively for global missions. And I said, yes, that's what we need. We need to pray for our marriages, for our children, for our work. We need to pray for this or that. All those things are good, but the best prayers the people of God can offer, can devote themselves to is that the good news will spread to those who have not heard. Prayers that will embolden missionaries who are serving even in places like Jordan, in Saudi Arabia, in India where the Hindus may be hostile. Places where there is no electricity, no water, no roads, but people are there waiting for the Bible to be translated, for the children to be taught. That's the kind of prayer that should occupy or preoccupy our minds, our spirits. So let me ask you, do you have some people groups yet unreached on your personal prayer list? Do you have a a missionary or a mission organization that you pray for regularly? Also, together and that God means we do missions in holiness and with integrity. Nehemiah, in the course of rebuilding the wall, appointed leaders with high integrity. All servants of God must go to him daily for grace to set themselves apart as golden vessels to be used for noble purposes. The Apostle Paul set a very high moral standard for Timothy, Titus, and others who served with him and after him in missions. Even as you pursue high academic excellence in this institution, I encourage you to back it with a commitment to high moral integrity. May God help us. And the second thing I want to point out from the story of Nehemiah and the Jews rebuilding the broken walls of Jerusalem is that we must work together with each and one another. And two ways to examine this. First, all and each of us must must put our hands on the deck just as the 40 teams Nehemiah mobilized did 
to complete the two and a half mile long wall in 52 short days. One person, one team alone could not do it. And so all of us from all the continents, expatriates and indigenous missionaries are needed to complement and supplement each other's effort to get the job done. We need to submit to God and one another and value and respect the role of others. We alone cannot do all the work of God. We need others. The second thing about working together and with each other is for us to focus on the inspiration we bring to each other as we serve together. Can you imagine the inspiration the builders of the Jerusalem wall drew from one another as high priests, priests, nobles, commoners, carpenters, blacksmiths, and all manner of people in the 40 different teams were working side by side on the same project with a common goal to complete? Are you living your life to inspire others? Who inspires you in your walk with the Lord and in your Christian service? I want to share the stories of two past missionaries who inspire me a lot. And I hope they will bring you a fresh inspiration this morning, even if you have heard of them before. The first one is Isabel Dittmar, who went out as a missionary from here in the U.S. and went to China and Japan in 1936. And she served for 40 years, did a lot of Bible translation, worked among many and rich people groups. Would you believe that at the age of 26, as a single woman getting ready to go to the missionary field, she had all her teeth removed before going to that field. She knew she would be 700 miles away from the nearest dentist and did not want dental needs to distract her from reaching the many and rich people groups who were waiting for her. What a model for us to emulate. Have you also heard of how William Carey, now regarded as the founder of modern missions, was initially rejected by his church as unqualified for missionary work? He was persistent in his obedience and went without any support. He mainly did farming and leather work to provide for his family and the great work God had called him to do. After 15 years on the field and the evidence of productive labor, his home church started to support him. So look to God. Talk to the president, to your teachers, to your elders. Seek the best advice. But above all of them, our missionary calling comes from God. And when he lays a burden on your heart, be obedient to him. My brothers and sisters, we have a broken wall of 7,000 and rich people groups to reach. There is no time to waste. Let us work together under God and with one another to get the job done. I look forward to seeing many of you uh, in Peoria, November 16th uh, to the 19th. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.